Well, good evening. My name is Benjamin Kidd, amateur radio call sign KG4EIF. Let me go ahead and share my screen so you can see the presentation. And I realize that I'm probably about uh, two months too late on this pun, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, well, of course, we've subtitled this Amateur Radio and CNC because this is an amateur radio meeting. Uh, we further subtitled it, blah, 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 ham radio stuff. Uh, that was a contribution of my son. <clears throat> and happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. But second, the CNC is in this presentation as well. And uh, so... We will actually start running that in a few minutes, and it will be running for the duration of the presentation. I already told everyone on Zoom uh, how to pin it if they would like to, uh, but uh, just wanted to make you all aware of that. Okay. Now, without further ado, CNC. What is CNC? CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control, which is you know not an entirely creative uh, acronym, I suppose, but it works. And essentially, what you're doing is you're taking some sort of a tool. It's usually a machine tool of some type, and you're hooking a computer up to it and controlling it. Um, so this is going to, you know, be able to automate any number of, of things. Uh, it's going to be able to turn motors on and off, move things around, operate solenoids and valves, that sort of thing. And kind of the, the, the main theme uh, here with, with CNC and its definition is that you have the instructions for making a part rather than being on a print stuck up on the wall and having a machinist sitting there turning knobs or you know pushing buttons to make the equipment to perform its actions to make a part you actually have the computer in control doing that and usually you're starting from some sort of a cad computer aided design to get there all right that's a little bit more probably what people would think about when they said cnc so Disclaimers, caveats, warnings, etc. First of all, I'm not an expert. I'm more of an amateur. The information that I'm going to talk about is going to pertain primarily to hobbyist CNC. So if any of you are actual professional machinists or CNC operators, I apologize to you. I will probably say things that um, aren't really uh, kosher in, in the professional world. But, you know, like I said, amateur. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that CNC, I'm not presenting this as the end-all to be-all for making stuff. It isn't. There are so very, very many ways to do things, and um, it doesn't require a computer to do it. In fact, as my boss demonstrates often, you can take a cordless drill and a file and make just about anything. So, And then, of course, this is yet another money pit <clears throat> if we weren't spending enough on our rigs. All right. History of CNC, real brief. Um, I kind of trace the lineage, and this is my opinion. I'm sure if you talk to a machine technology historian, they would have uh, varying opinions about this from mine, but I would kind of trace this back to the kind of the, the duplicator technologies that if you ever go to Monticello and see um, Thomas Jefferson's study, he, ha he has one of these, um, the picture right there in the, the middle of the screen. The idea that you can take a design and have a machine or by mechanical means duplicate that design. It's kind of the beginnings of this, this sort of notion. Uh, other important historical events, really the, the kind of the beginning or, or I guess I should say the precursor to the Industrial Revolution. In the 1750s, you have the first modern lathe. And um, there's a gentleman on YouTube, his channel is called Machine Thinking, which I've got the link down there in the middle makes a really fascinating case for how the lathe is kind of the tool that begets all these other tools. Uh, again, I'm sure that's very debatable in historical terms, but it's quite interesting. 1800s, you start to see what we would consider modern machine tools. And when I talk about machine tools, I'm talking generally about lathes and mills and things like that. Um, so lathe, you have a spindle that turns a workpiece and you have some sort of a tool that you rest uh, on a tool rest and, and push into that workpiece to be able to carve out something uh, and, and get some really uh, very accurate uh, round shapes through that. And then a mill would be something that moves back and forth with, you know, some sort of a bit coming down and, and, and cutting through the material. 
<clears throat> you uh, get moving to the 1900s and you start to be uh, see attempts at automating those tools uh, to be able to follow templates and they'll use mechanical cams to do things like that in the 1950s after World War II and the technology that was developed during that time, you start to see kind of the first, they didn't have the C part of it, it was just NC at that time, numerical control. And that was being done with um, tape and probably a little bit later on punch card type systems. The 1960s, you know, we're starting to see some, uh, some computerized technology working its way into the machine tool world. And um, you went from computers that were the size of warehouses to now computers that were the size of, you know, generous master bedroom closets. So that suddenly became more possible to stick a computer next to or close to anyways, a machine tool. Uh, 1980s, of course, now you've got personal computers, and this is really a game changer. Um, finally, kind of 2001, the one other point I would highlight is that... Um, a, a gentleman who uh, was really into CNC decided he wanted to try to get into the hobbyist market with it and wrote some software that would run on a PC that would actually act uh, to to perform the machine control directly from the PC. Uh, that was called Mock Software. Now it's called Mock 3 and Mock 4, not to be confused with the shaving company. Okay, types of CNC machines. There are many, 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 many types. I am only showing kind of the things that most people are familiar with. And you may have even seen some commercials or at least some ads when you're online. I'm going to break these down into two basic categories. The first is XYZ machines. That is to say that they will move in three axes, an X, a Y, and a Z in, in three-dimensional space to perform their actions. They're usually subclassed by the kind of tool that they can run. So you might have a router, which is literally like a wood router that you might use in your home shop. Um, then you have laser cutters, which is what it sounds like. You put a laser on a CNC and it can cut things out. Plasma cutters for cutting metal. You have paper cutters. If you've heard of Cricut or, um, of course, I forgot what the other one is, but it's the one that my, my dad has. Um, and there's probably a few other companies out there that will make uh, things that will cut things out of paper and cardboard and, uh, you know, make some really elaborate decorations all from your computer. Um, and then kind of on the flip side from the XYZ machines, you have uh, lathes and, and in particular CNC control or, or CNC based lathes, which are um, those are not as common, but they are out there. All right. So. Focusing in on the XY machine, machine, I was mentioning how they move in three dimensions. So typical machine layout would be something like this, where the Y is moving along back into the page, the X is left to right as we're looking at the CNC, and then the Z would be up and down. Uh, just to run through a few quick definitions, I won't get too much into this, but I'll probably toss these around a little bit so I want to at least define them. A workpiece is generally in CNC world going to refer to the thing that you're cutting uh, or the material you're using uh, to make a part out of. And for me, that is going to primarily be uh, plywood or maybe some dimensional lumber or uh, possibly some plastic or PVC. Tool would be whatever it is that you're using to do the cutting. Uh, so it could be a bit. In the case of the paper cutter, it'd be a knife, a laser, torch, so on and so forth. Spoil board is the thing that you're going to rest your workpiece on so that when you cut through that workpiece and you're going to have to cut a little bit deeper than you would uh, than just the thickness of your workpiece, you don't want to be cutting into the, the chassis of your CNC. Um, that's usually expensive and you don't want to have to replace that often. So you need something that can be uh, occasionally replaced. And this is often called the spoil board because get spoiled. Toolpath is going to be the path that your machine takes to go through the material to, to make a cut. Work holding, which has been surprisingly one of the bigger challenges for me, that is to say keeping your workpiece, or in my case, a piece of plywood, down in, and not moving around as the tool is moving to try to cut it, because once it starts moving, bad things happen, break, bits break, CNC parts break. Not good. All right, stepper motors. Stepper motors are the primary um, motor technology that's used within uh, XYZ CNCs, particularly in the hobbyist world. 
um, home switch. You might hear someone say, I need to home my machine. That means that the machine actually needs to come back to a specified place and say, hey, this is the origin. This is where I start working from. And that place will be indicated to the machine by some sort of a switch. It might be mechanical, might be optical, but it will come back when, when you home the machine. It will drive each access back to the corresponding switch for that access until it bumps into that switch and says, ah, that's where I start. Um, G-code is the way that uh, is the actual language that is spoken to the CNC to say, go to this position, turn on the router, start uh, plunge downwards into the material, start uh, cutting in this direction. So that's what um, G-code is. It's something you can actually write if you're a glutton for punishment, but in most cases, you're gonna be getting that out of uh, a, a CAD or actually technically a CAM tool. And then a motion controller is the thing that takes that G-code, which is coming from the computer, and then takes and interprets it and does the actual movement, kind of the puppet pulling the strings of the, the motors to make the various movements um, occur. All right. A lot of people would say CNC is, is not like 3D printing. Yes, it is very similar, but the main difference is that you are working with a what we will call a subtractive technology. You are Michelangelo, you're um, removing everything that isn't your masterpiece. So whereas with 3D printing, you're doing the opposite. You're starting with nothing and you're slowly layering up and depositing material in order to create whatever it is that, uh, whatever your part is. Um, strictly speaking, one could make an argument that 3D printing is a subset of CNC, but most people don't talk about it that way, so I won't. Uh, some other interesting differences, well, interesting to me anyways, uh, people will talk about CAM. CAM is how you uh, generate that machine code in CNC and 3D printing. It's called a slicer because it's literally taking slices of your model and saying, I'm going to deposit this much on this layer and that much in that layer and so on and so forth. Uh, the operational principle with the CNC, you're cutting, uh, I kind of already went over this with the 3D printer, you are building up material uh, with a, a depositor. CNC, you're generally, at least with, with an XY machine, you're generally going to be kind of working mostly in 3D. Um, you're kind of limited because you can only work from one direction at a time unless you have really deep pockets, in which case you might be able to have a, a tool that can rotate the workpiece and then be able to come at it from different angles. You will not find that often in the hobbyist world. Uh, so you're usually doing one face at a time, so that can kind of limit things. Whereas with the 3D printer, because you are building things up in layers, you can actually create quite sophisticated three-dimensional shapes. Um, materials with a CNC, the sky is, well, it's not the limit, but you're very, you have quite a variety of things that you can machine with CNCs, depending on the type of tool and type of machine that you're using. Whereas with 3D printing, for the most part, um, you're going to be working in plastic. I know there are some metal printing CNCs, but those are gonna usually be out of range of the, at least the hobbyist arena. And then of course, because you're working only in plastic and usually it's a thermal plastic, it's gonna be pretty weak. So it's if you're trying to make structural parts with a 3D printer, um, it's it may not work out. Although, um, I don't know, Mike, you might end up disagreeing with me there. Speaking of which, uh, Mike, KQ four, uh, not gosh, KQ nine P uh, is hopefully, if we twist his arm hard enough, going to be doing a presentation on three D printing coming soon. All right, um, my CNC. This is named for Lieutenant Commander Jordi LaForge from Star Wars: The Next Generation. I hope my wife is not listening because I will be sleeping next to the CNC for saying that. But I always like ticking off the Trekkies. Okay, it's Star Trek. Yeah. All right, um, this is a Micromat MM24. It was built in the 1980s. I think there were only about 40 or 50 of them made, and I believe they were actually manufactured in England. And it kind of, um, well, I won't go into the story of, of how I ended up with it, but we, um, uh, one of our customers at work uh, had one of these and didn't want it taking up shop space anymore. They had no use for it. So I was... Uh, a grateful recipient of a CNC that needed a home and quite a bit of work. 
Um, so real quick, how does the CNC move? Now we have motors, which are going to drive this thing. Stepper motors, as I mentioned, are kind of your predominant technology, but you also can use server motors. Um, the motor, both of those motor technologies are going to create rotational motion. That is, they're going to spin around an axis. Axis. How do you get that to become linear motion, to be able to move back and forth, up and down, side to side? The answer is, generally speaking, two different ways. One is either using a lead screw, which is like a piece of all thread. The other option is using a timing belt. Uh, we'll kind of go with my example here with the, with my CNC. You see at the top, we've got a stepper motor, then that couples down to that lead screw. Again, long all thread like piece of material. You have a nut, which is what the, the, the axis is actually fixed to right here, which is where the, the router is attached over on the right there. And then, then you've got a bearing down at the bottom to be able to support that. And so what this actually looks like is this. So as the motor spins, it turns the thread, and then that in turn pushes the what, what is called the half nut up and down and creates that linear motion. And that's happening not just on what you're seeing the Z axis here, but on all the other two axes as well. All right. Now oh, I did mention linear motors. That's You're not going to find that likely to be on a um, hobby machine. All right. So... Workflow, what is kind of, okay, we, we have this machine and it can, can cut stuff. All right, well, how do we get from an idea to a actual part? And so we usually start with CAM, some sort, or CAM, excuse me, CAD, which is computer-aided design. And that could be in 2D or 3D. Here I've shown a, a 3D image. And that will then go into a second tool, which is CAM. CAM stands for Computer Aided Manufacturing. And so that will take the information, the drawing that you generated in CAD, and will then uh, make it so that you can define the machining operations which are going to occur. That will then spit out G code, which we mentioned before, which is the actual code for saying you're going to go here and do this thing. That then ends up going into some machine control software, which will actually be doing the uh, sent the sending of that G code down to the actual CNC and the motion co controller that is running it. All right, just to, for for those of you that enjoy block diagrams, this is kind of the basic electrical overview, at least in my particular CNC's case. But this is pretty common. So you have three axes, an X, Y, and a Z, and those are run uh, using stepper motors. Those stepper motors are in turn, if we're kind of working our way backwards towards the computer, driven by an actual, an amplifier, essentially, uh, a stepper motor driver that takes the logic level signals from the motion controller and translates or adds the necessary power to be able to actually turn these motors and provide um, for the, well, the power necessary to, to, for the motors to have torque. The motion controller, as I mentioned before, is going to be attached back to the computer, and that is actually doing all the sort of hard real-time number crunching to make everything move in synchronization. I also mentioned the home switches. Those are for, uh, again, to being able to tell the machine, you're starting from this position, and then at that point, moving forwards, at least in my particular machine's case, it works off of what you might call dead reckoning or what is probably more correctly termed open loop control, where once it starts moving, it's just saying, move this motor 20 steps, move that motor 30 steps. And if for some reason it crashes into something or uh, the bit is dull and it can't push through that particular uh, part of the workpiece, you start losing steps and you start losing accuracy. So, uh, But it's a lot cheaper that way. And of course, my tool in this particular case is going to be a router. All right. So to kind of further talk for a moment about CAD, computer-aided design, um, you have 3D tools, you have 2D tools. I'm listed a bunch here. I won't go into this very much. Uh, the one that I like using for 3D is called SketchUp. I'm actually using an older version of it. Um, there are uh, a number of free and uh, I guess, relatively cheap options out there for the hobbyist. 
And that's a, Google is a great place to start for that. Same with 2D. CAM, computer aided manufacturing software. Uh, again, we're using this to take the, the drawings that we generated with CAD and then be able to actually uh, set up various machine operations, which I will go into in a moment. Uh, I will say I have uh, a CAM package, which is called CAMBAM. It costs about 150 bucks and it is worth every penny. And it's also actually a fairly decent uh, CAD package as well. So I can kind of do a lot of stuff just right there. So machining operations, when I, I mentioned machining operations, here are some basic ones to, uh, at least within the, the space uh, the, of uh, what we call router CNC, so the CNC with a wood router on it. Um, you have an outer profile, which is to say that you are removing everything outside of a particular shape. You also have an inner profile where you're removing something inside of a particular shape. Then you have drill. Drill is literally just making a hole you know, plunging down through the material to make a hole. Pocketing. Pocketing is where you actually would remove uh, all the material inside of here. And what's different about that from an inside profile is usually you're not going all the way through the material. And so the, the machine actually has to trace out all of that area in order to make that pocket. And then engraving is where you might actually be trying to this is often going to be used if you're making a sign or something where you're only cutting slightly into the material to create some sort of a relief. All right. Now that we've talked a little bit about what CNC is, talk a little bit uh, now about safety uh, that is worth considering. Obviously, you're working with tools, cutting tools in particular. They're sharp. You're dealing with rotating machinery. You need to you know, use appropriate precautions, just like with any other tool that that you're dealing with um, you know, drill presses, saws, et cetera. It's this, the same thing goes here. Um, safety glasses for sure. Hearing protection is always recommended, particularly if you're running louder tools like I am with a router and a, a shop vac and all the noise that that's gonna make. If you're dealing with lasers, you probably need to be considering using laser goggles um, in case something breaks three, free and the laser points in a direction it shouldn't. Um, you definitely are going to need ventilation if you're using a laser, by the way, because you actually are literally burning through material when you're using it. Um, if you're using a plasma cutter, you're going to need welding goggles and, you know, so on and so forth. Each mach machine is going to require, or each tool, I guess I should say, is going to require its own um, set of precautions appropriate to it. But there is one particular thing that I want to draw out um, as far as importance. Did I get anyone? Okay. You're taking a tool and you are hooking it to a computer. So you have to keep that in mind that um, things can go unexpectedly. And uh, so all that to say, that when you're using a CNC, I highly recommend that you have, if it doesn't already come with one, an emergency stop button that is well within reach of anywhere that you would be around that machine so that even if the computer stops responding, you can shut the machine down uh, or bring it to a safe state, I should say. So um, I won't go into depth with that, but that was just, a, I wanted to make that point. One other thing that I found out a couple weeks ago don't cut with drill uh, with uh, bits that are really dull. As it turns out, shop vacs really provide plenty of air uh, for embers. And you know that old trick of rubbing sticks on wood to make a fire works really well with the dull router bit. Okay, yeah, enough of that. Oh, come on. Yeah, I know. Just keep shoving it in my face. Thanks. All right. So the question is, what does all this have to do with ham radio? And of course, the answer is absolutely nothing. But John Porter needed someone to present. So here we are. OK, not really. All right. So a few example projects uh, to, to run through real quick. Personalized insulators. I am sure that adding your call sign or name to the insulator increases the dielectric value and the overall performance for your antenna. 
pretty sure of that. Call signs, very important, or call sign signs, very important. If you're in the middle of a contest, you need to remember what your call sign and maybe what your name is. So having that up on the wall in your shack is nearly essential. Uh, another example of, of something fun, and I, I realize that I'm kind of cheating and saying this is amateur radio related, but uh, shadow box for keeping your, your soda mementos in. If you, uh, you know, grab a little pebble or something from the summit, got to have a place to put it. CNCs can be used to make printed circuit boards. I don't recommend doing it except in a pinch, but they can do it. Uh, it's a lot of setup. You have to be very precise in the uh, the the level of your tool. Otherwise, uh, you end up with your you know plowing right through the middle of your printed circuit board and ruining it. But it can be done. And there are people that um, like making printed circuit boards this way, and there are specialized tools for it out there, including specialized software tools for converting your um, your uh, Gerber files from your printed circuit board design into a um, into a machinable G-code design that can be run on a CNC. Tape measure, uh, Yagi's, for direction finding and such. You can make some mounts for it. I know the traditional way is using PVC pipe, but um, why go out and spend a dollar when I can spend two and a half hours and uh, a $20 piece of PVC board? This might be the only project that I've ever actually saved money if I counted time and materials. And that is, uh, I don't know, ICOM is, I think they have affordable radios, but gosh, if you want accessories for them, forget about it. So I made a mount to hold, and I can't believe it didn't come with one, but for, for my mobile radio, I made a mount to hold it on the dashboard. And this is actually, uh, by the way, fiberglass material. So um, not uh, you're not just stuck with um, wood and plastic with a router. You can do some other materials. You just have to have the right bit for it. What if you wanted to say, demonstrate the technology of CNC uh, to your local club? Then you might want to make something. And of course, I was supposed to do this about 20 slides ago, but I'm going to start the CNC running now, which this reminded me of. So uh, for anyone that would like to, you might want to take a look at Jordy is he's gonna start moving, hopefully, there he goes. And so we're actually going to be cutting out um, this design right here. And um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about that, I think for the moment, but uh, for those of you that are in person, you actually have one of these sitting right there in front of you. And uh, yeah, excellent, okay. All right, so. Because I couldn't leave well enough alone, I went ahead and I made a video of making this particular project and I distilled uh, probably about four hours of work into a minute and 30 seconds. I hope you took your Dramamine. Starting off, we have just, I, I like to start with a hand-drawn sketch. I don't usually jump immediately to CAD because it's just easier to sit down with a piece of paper and kind of get my major design goals down. And so that's what you see me doing here. The next thing, of course, will be going into CAD. I'm sorry, this jumps around a lot. But um, you see me start to kind of flesh out the shape of this thing and then to start to work out all the details about how the pieces will interlock and join together, where the screw holes are going to be, all that sort of thing. Then we jump into CAM, where I'm actually defining those machining operations we talked about earlier, where it's making pockets and uh, drilling holes and doing profiles. There's my call sign. So I can put it on that black plate right there in the front. And then we start the machine running. And so it's starting to make those cuts, which you actually also see in the live view, though much, much slower. And like I said, I should have started that about 20 slides ago, because it, as you can see in, in the actual live view, the CNC moves fairly slowly. And then we have kind of final assembly here where I'm actually taking all the pieces and putting them together. So this is kind of another thing that sort of um, is kind of a major difference between 3D printing uh, and CNC, which is a lot of times 3D printing, you're kind of making the whole part with the 3D print. Whereas with CNC, you're probably going to be making a bunch of parts that are gonna come together into something larger. Although that's, I mean, that's, a, that's quite a generalization I realize. All right. Now, 
<clears throat> All right. So uh, fun little project. Um, this was great because I managed uh, in making these. Uh, if For those of you who were that field day and you saw me walk up with a whole gaggle of kids, we built these right there at field day. And it was great because the kids loved it. And we managed to tick off all the CW guys because they had no idea what was going on. All of a sudden, everyone starts beeping over from the kids' tent. And then all the parents hated me because they had to drive home with these things going off in their cars. So we had a lot of fun with that. Um, antenna. Can you build an antenna with a CNC? Well, strictly speaking, you probably could actually take some aluminum and machine it out to make the antenna elements. But in this particular case, I built a frame and then took some solid uh, number 12 wire and stretched it over that frame with zip ties. And again, those of you in the, the in-person meeting, uh, that, that antenna is actually there for you to look at. This is what it looks like in the real world. It started off with an antenna calculator online to just get the dimensions, then put it into CAD. And that's what it looks like. And as you can see, it's a super compact design, great for hiking around with. <clears throat> sure. But it works. Uh, there's a few more views, what it looks like. And what you might notice is that it's actually been made in two different major parts. And the reason is it literally doesn't fit. Um, if I were to try to make that whole thing, it wouldn't fit on the, the whole CNC. So I made it in two parts and then joined it together with that center plate there. All right. There's, uh, by the way, kind of highlighting where the elements are. Okay, how about a guy wire winder for your soda antenna pole? Kind of helpful. And you'll notice it's multi-use. You wrap the, the uh, guy wires up on it when you're done. And then uh, when it's set up and deployed, you can actually hook your radio onto it. And I've got some spots so you can clip accessories and the speaker mic and all that stuff and just kind of keep stuff up out of the dirt. Here's the whole whole thing uh, kind of put together on me and because she was jealous that her brothers got uh, their pictures in the presentation. So I had to include her. All right. Um, also noticed uh, a few months ago that um, it's really hard to hold a mic and uh, a piece of paper and a pencil all at the same time. And so I thought, well, what, what if we used a clipboard and I noticed that pilots use these uh, to to be able to keep logs while they're flying. So I'm like, well, shoot, I can make that for at least three times the cost of what I could buy it for. So let's do it. And uh, so, but it's fun because I was able to personalize the back of it and I made some for some friends, and my kids and everything. I, uh, at the urging of Alan, AG4VA, I uh, decided to make kind of a a clone or a design based off of the DX Commander uh, HF antenna. Um, and so one of the things I did was I actually made the spreaders out of three layers of plywood so that instead of having to always thread the wire through the holes, that you could actually insert it through the side. It's I should have magnified this a little more, but um, it's, uh, it's a great innovation on paper. In practice, I don't know if I've actually improved anything, but it was fun. Um, there is also the feed plate for that DX Commander type antenna, and uh, that I machined out of printed circuit board material, again with, with the CNC. Um, I use the one at work, which is the same machine as what I have at home, but uh, we just have bits that are designed for cutting through PCB material a little more easily. What if you need to make your mother a box for her radio? Well, I have a CNC, I should do that made for a great Christmas present. and was only a month late. Um, here we're taking an IC uh, 237, or sorry, 2730, and you know, creating kind of a, a go box of sorts where everything's put all together in one package and all you have to do is essentially plug it into the wall and hook up an antenna. And so that's what it looks like in reality. Sorry, the background's terrible, but I'm I'm not known for my photography. And you can see how CAD to the actual thing, it's it's pretty pretty darn close. How about a go box for your IC7300? Um, same kind of idea here where I started off in, uh, after sort of fleshing the idea out on paper, um, then worked it out in 3D and then made it. And here is helping me with the assembly. And he actually did a fair amount of the wiring, which was really cool. 
And uh, you'll notice we have, again, power supply, the radio, and actually in this slot, I think we've got it in a later picture, I have a power meter up in there. There we go. And a um, few other little innovations. So, so aside from having everything kind of pre-connected and, and only needing to hook up an antenna, um, I have a little storage drawer for the accessories. And um, if you've ever, uh, I think everyone has, you know, Ikea bookshelves and shelves like them will have those peg holes that you can put in a little little supports into and adjust your shelf height. I did that so that you could um, set it in the, the protective frame that you use to cover it up when you're not using it and then be able to tilt it back to be able to view uh, a little more seamlessly or at a better angle. And of course we have to have our lifestyle and use pictures and um, this has been a real helpful way to keep the equipment protected when I'm on the go doing things either at, at the, the kids' school or um, back in the middle of the pandemic, uh, uh, going to visit my parents on field day and sitting up there, and so, or, or just sitting out on the front porch. Wow, well, that, that, uh, that was fantastic. And, uh, Thank you so much, and that was uh, that was neat. You know, this is one of those presentations that could be hazardous to your wealth. <laughs> so, Benjamin, I've got a quick question. Mm -hmm. So, you talked about holding the work in place. I'm curious, how are you holding those pieces? Those pieces that you've cut entirely around, why don't those wander away? Uh, one, everyone go out and buy stock in 3M because <laughs> I'm using all the masking tape. Um, two. I, I actually, I use masking tape for most of my hold down. So if you see in the CNC, it's taped around the edges, but I also take the tape and roll it and run it diagonally um, across the, 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 the spoil board as well at several, in, you know, probably about six inch intervals and then ah. press the plywood. And it's amazing how much strength a piece of rolled up uh, masking tape, two inch, you know, painter's tape basically uh, it's amazing how much shear strength you will get. It's easy to pull right off the thing, but from a shifting in the, what we'll call the X and Y plane of the CNC, you can't push it off. Like it holds it really hard. Now, the second thing I will say is that I use what are called um, holding tabs, where as it started, you'll, you might see it's starting to do the final cutouts of the parts right now. What it does is in four places, you know, roughly the four corners of the piece, it's going to pop up and go back down a little further away and not cut the piece entirely out of the plywood. So everything is still stuck in there. So again, this is kind of like you might, you'll see this in printed circuit board world where you have a panel of printed circuit boards and most of the material will be removed from around all the circuit boards in the panel, but there'll be just a little bit holding it in that panel. And then you'll you'll snap it out later, you know, with with a tool or maybe it just breaks away. Or probably the ones even more familiar to everyone would be models, um, you know, model airplanes, model trains. Uh, whenever you have to remove the pieces from those little plastic sprues, it's kind of like that. So um, the the trick is to either have really good hold down through tape, or some people will actually use a vacuum table, or to um, just not completely cut your part out and make sure that the overall piece is held in place really well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so Benjamin, a quick question. When you, for those tabs, is that something that that you manually put into the, uh, the cam portion yourself or does the software actually put tabs in based on the design you have? Uh, it's it's a little of both. Uh, there is a setting in the in in at least in CamBam. I can't speak to other Cam packages, but at least mm -hmm. in, in the package that I use, there's actually a setting when you do a profile, you can tell it, "Hey, I want you to add holding tabs," and then you can further refine it and tell it, "I want you know you can either tell it I want you to add somewhere between three and six tabs." And it'll put in as many as it thinks it should have. I'm not sure how it use what it uses to determine that, or I can just say put this many in and then I'll move them around to where I want them. Cause you usually want it on an edge that you can get at easily with a block of sandpaper uh, or a sanding block or, a, or, or, you know, a tool of some sort to get it off there when you're done. Uh, to Benjamin, when, oven. Benjamin, when did you, when did you start this hobby? How long have you been doing it now? Um, 
Well, probably about 10 years. And oh. I have the benefit of getting to do this at work. Uh, again, I'm not trained to do it, but for doing fixtures and stuff like that. Uh, generally, the, the things that I'm doing are not going directly to a customer, but they may be used to help um, uh, in our, our uh, you know, production of, again, we're, I work for a contract manufacturer that makes printed circuit boards, assemblies. So uh, it's useful for making things for that. So I was able to get paid to learn a lot of how to do this so that when uh, the, the CNC kind of fell into my lap, well, thank goodness it didn't fall into my lap because I think it weighs about a thousand pounds. But uh, when that became available, uh, it's actually the same machine that we have at work. Uh, I already had kind of a framework for uh, how to get it working and what I needed to actually uh, purchase and install and stuff and the new sort of the tools that I wanted to use already. Well, thank you. Very let's good. give let's give Ben another round. This is me. This is me. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um,